sure to follow the format so we can get ready. Um, we're going to do roll roll call. S roll call of basically the committee members. That includes the new committee members. So what would be good if we could quickly to keep us on task because we have some guest speakers. I want to make sure they get plenty of time to um, communicate. So if the committee members first would go through and introduce themselves and their name of the business and their location. Does that work? Joey, are yeah. you ready for that? Yes, I'm ready. OK, so I'll start. My name is Noelle Hansen. I own Kid Angles Early Education School. I have two at homes, um, class two license, and I'm out of Bloomington. Joey, you go next. Hi, my name's Joey Scherschel. Um, I'm the secretary. I have two child care homes in Lawrence County. Go, Steph. Hi, this is Stephanie. I am assistant chair. Um, I am located in Kokomo, Indiana, and my child care is Caterpillar Clubhouse Nature Preschool. And then everybody else, just one of you jump in at a time. <coughs> Hi, this, this is Tam Maria Lynn. Oh, say it oh, again. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm Maria Wynn from Evansville, Indiana, and the name of my family child care is Casa Maria's Creative Learning Zone. Awesome. And this is Tamela. I'm just member abroad. Um, I have two class twos in Marion County, a before and after school program and a preschool only, and then I have four class twos in Hendricks County, a before and after school program and a preschool only. Awesome. Hi, this is Jacqueline Nagri. Um, I'm in Hancock County, New Palestine, in, um, and I have one in-home class two license. I'm sorry for the background noise. I'm on the beach right now. For me. Oh, right? <laughs> oh tear. Hi, this is Rebecca <laughs> Kenworthy. I didn't know if you were able to hear me. Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> OK, uh, this is a new computer. I actually have Joy Shell inspecting one of my units right now, so I had to excuse <laughs> myself for a minute. Um, I own five Indiana State licensed um, child uh, care homes in Gibson County, and we have uh, two level fours and uh, three level three units. OK, awesome. Anybody else? This is Marcy Graves. I own a class one child care in Park County, Indiana. Welcome. I'm Cynthia Natalie in oh. Indianapolis. I own a nationally accredited class two in uh, Marion County. Welcome. Can you repeat what whose name was that? That was Cynthia. Thank you. Natalie Next. Harrison, I own a level three in Delaware County. Welcome. Anybody else? Woo. Okay. If, if, someone else or we didn't grab someone else make sure to um let us know um we have enough to have a quorum Woo! that was our first step so what we need to officially do um we have no meeting minutes from the last one so moving forward when we have our next meeting we will need to approve the meeting minutes from this meeting um but since we have none we can go ahead and um move on to something else, which is we need to prove this has already been in existence, but I want to make sure that we already um, have it approved. And some of you should have seen the notes. 
we just need to approve that we have changed the meeting times from a Thursday, actually the, from a Tuesday in January, April, July, and October, we need to change them to February, May, August, November. This is what we have already been meeting at, but to make it official, we need to make sure that it is officially changed in our bylaws. The reason that we did this, and I'm sorry if I'm yelling, you know, that preschool voice, I feel like I'm screaming at everybody. <laughs> um, but the reason it was changed is that before it seemed like it always landed on a holiday. So by doing this, we seem to avoid the holiday. So um, that's the one we need to prove as well as that we have to have a minimum of five, which has been the going standard. I just want to make sure that it's in our bylaws. So you can see in the minutes that I've highlighted that somebody needs to give a shout out that they move to approve the bylaw changes and then someone needs to give their name and second that motion. So don't this is speak Joey, and I'll approve it. Okay, and we need someone to second it. This is Tamala Steppy. I second that motion. Yay, okay, this is so exciting to actually have people. Okay, so, um, so that this is an informative meeting, we have two guest speakers, and we're going to go ahead and move to them so that they can answer and give us information and then they can go on with part of their day. So our first guest speaker is going to be Mackenzie. So Mackenzie, will you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yes, thank you. Um, it's great to be here with you all. I think I saw some of you on calls last week and um, we may see some of you again tomorrow. Um, but for those of you I haven't met, my name is Mackenzie Pelland. I'm the director of Early Childhood education observation systems, which is a mouthful, at the Council for Professional Recognition, which is the agency who um, oversees the CDA credentialing process. Um, so we are here to talk today. I'm in a few slides to go through about the professional development specialist role. And um, we've been doing a lot of engagement and outreach within the state of Indiana to gather more PD specialists. Um, and potentially, you know, recruit more PD specialists, but particularly in the family child care space and in the home space. That's a, a huge need in Indiana um, and especially Spanish speaking professional development specialists. And so we thought what better way um, to get the word out than uh, engage this network. And even if you're not necessarily someone who might be interested in the role, we have a uh, one page that I'll share at the very end of my slides that goes through through um, the role that you might be able to share with anyone who might be interested, and it is in both English and Spanish. Um, before I share my screen, though, I just wanted to give my colleague, who's also on, um, a chance to introduce herself, Vicki Rendinsky, um, who will be available to answer any questions as well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki Rosinski. Um, I am here with the Council for Pro Professional Recognition as the manager of the ECE observation systems alongside Mackenzie. Um, I am here in Indiana, so I'm a fellow Hoosier and have been in this system a long time, probably have connected with most of you along the way um, as family child care providers. So just really excited to be here. Thanks, Vicki. All right, let me share my screen and I'll go through these quickly for you all. Um, so first and foremost, we started by introducing ourselves, but there's our names in case you need to see them, Mackenzie and Vicki. Um, and our team is the EC Observation Systems team, which is the team who oversees the verification visit portion of the credentialing process. So I'll go into a little bit for those who are not necessarily maybe not familiar with the CDA, what that means, um, but we are here to ensure that the process in order for our candidate to obtain their um, child development associate is um, valid, reliable, and that the actual on-site or virtual visit happens um, without a hitch for both the professional development specialist who's doing the observations as well as the candidate who's obtaining the credential. Um, so our objectives for our short little spiel today is to identify the PD specialist role in the CDA credentialing process and to ultimately inspire you to either become a PDS or share this information with your network if there's anyone who you think this might be a good fit for. 
Um, so for those who are not familiar with the CDA, um, the CDA is the most widely recognized credential in early childhood education, and we consider it a key stepping stone on the path of career advancement for an early childhood educator. That's why we call it the best first step. Um, it is based on a set of core competencies standards that guide early childhood professionals towards becoming qualified educators of young children. Um, what's really unique and we think special about the credential is that it is nationally transferable. So that means it's nationally recognized. So if someone's um, just think especially working on the border in Indiana, potentially working in Kentucky or working in Illinois, they're able to take that credential with them um, and work across state lines. Um, so we work um, to ensure that it's nationally transferable um, and, as I mentioned, that it's credible and a valid credential that remains a recognized, um, that remains recognized by the profession and is a vital part of professional development. Um, the credential is an accessible credential. It's $425 and it is, it, and I'll go into a minute what it takes to get there, but um, you, you don't necessarily need an you know, any college credit in order to get your credentials. So it's really, we're finding, um, again, the best first step in an early educator's career that they may be able to take with them um, to get credits towards their AA or their BEA, depending on the college's articulation agreements. Um, so the credential culminates into three parts, which we call prepare, apply, and demonstrate. So just because I'm sure, I don't know, everyone's familiarity, but um, the in order to be able to apply to get a CDA credential, a candidate needs to have a combination of literacy and education, as well as experience. So for literacy and education, uh, a candidate will need to have their high school diploma or GED, or be enrolled as a junior or senior in a high school career and technical um, education program in early ed. Um, this is actually where we're seeing a lot of energy uh, recently for the CDA is around the high school CTE programs. Um, so we have a lot of candidates who are coming through our um, credentialing process who are getting their coursework and their experience um, at on-site child care programs at high schools and taking classes at high schools. And so it's something we're really excited about and think that it's a good way for um, people to get their feet wet in the early childhood world and also be able to graduate high school with a, with a credential, which is great. Um, they also need to have, as I kind of briefly mentioned, 120 hours um, of formal early education training um, with no fewer than 10 hours in each of our eight subject areas. So this does not need necessarily to be from a college or university. It just needs to be obtained through um, organizations. And it could be a single training agency or several training organizations, but organizations that have experience and expertise in early childhood education and teacher prep. Um, they just need to be able to provide documentation of this training uh, because that's what gets checked by our PD specialist. Um, additionally, moving on to experience, candidates within three years of applying for a CDA need to have completed 480 hours of professional experience, which equates to about six months of full time work. So that doesn't necessarily have to be all done in a six month period. It just needs to be within three months of applying for a CDA. Um, and the work experience needs to be in the setting of which they are applying. So we have different credential types, one of which is family child care, but we also have center-based preschool, center-based infant toddler, and as well as a home visiting credential. And so the experience just needs to be in the setting by which, of which their credential they're applying for. Um, this all culminates in my favorite part of the credentialing process, which is a professional portfolio, but it's what the documentation piece here. Candidates actually prepare some written statements about their philosophy um, in teaching uh, young children. They collect some reference materials, like some of their favorite books in the classroom, um, some information that they've received and feedback they've received from families. Uh, and all of that's put together in a portfolio that is reviewed during an on-site visit uh, by a PD specialist. Um, so they do need to apply online, which is you'll see there the application, but that's where they put in all their information um, and say essentially they're ready to go, they pay and they're ready to get scheduled. Um, and then that last P 
piece of the credentialing process is what's called demonstrate, and that is essentially where a candidate demonstrates their competency uh, working with young children. So that is that happens with both a verification visit and an exam. The verification visit is what we're going to be talking about today because that's what PD specialists actually do and implement um, as a part of the CDA credentialing process. But candidates also do need to take an exam uh, that they take at a Pearson View Center. So they actually go on site, take an exam very similar to if you were taking like a GED um, or other type of you know national test. Um, so that verification visit is what I just wanted to hone in on quickly here because this is what the PD specialist actually does for the council. Um, so PD specialists are all independent contractors that we train. We first, you know, make sure that they meet our requirements and then train them to be able to go out and observe CDA candidates. And they implement what is called, or we call an ROR model. Um, the model begins with, um, it, we call it review, observe, reflect. So review is a one hour um, review of that professional portfolio that I just mentioned. So they review the training documentation that was input um, the statements from the candidate, the resources they uploaded or chose to include. Um, and then there is a two hour observation of the candidate acting as the lead teacher for family child care homes. Normally the candidate is, you know, the, the director or lead in this in the program, but they don't necessarily have to be. They just have to be during that observation acting as the lead teacher. And then finally, the visit culminates with a reflection, which we call a reflective dialogue. And during this time, the candidate and the PDS, PD specialists actually work together to set some professional goals um, and talk about their areas of strength and growth based on their observation and professional portfolio. Um, ultimately, it's a really meaningful experience. It lasts about four hours. Um, and it, once a PDS captures all their notes and you know scores the candidate based on their observation, they input that into our online system. And those scores in combination with the exam are what make the final credentialing decision for the candidate. So PD specialists, um, who are they? They're essentially, they use their ECE expertise to assess CDA candidates on competencies and facilitate a reflective dialogue. Um, they're all degreed early childhood professionals um, who have demonstrated knowledge and experience um, to support early education professionals. Um, a lot of them are mentors, coaches. In my next slide, you'll see um, in terms of who makes great PD specialists, it's probably a lot of you on this call or people in your network. Um, it's people who are working in early education, people who enjoy mentoring, coaching, meeting new people, um, people who are wanting to work with aspiring early childhood professionals, especially I think in the time that we're in where we're needing to get more people into the workforce. It's a really rewarding um, and, and I think fun experience to be a PD specialist for these, for these candidates. Um, in terms of why would you want to be a PDS? One, you, you have a position of authority and influence in the field. Um, you're upholding the integrity of a national credential. Um, you're also able to engage with the professional development community across the country. So we have PDSs in every single state and also abroad because we have PDSs in military bases abroad and you're able to join in that community of PD specialist um, and you also receive an $100 honorarium for each visit in recognition of your time and effort. So now to the nitty gritty uh, and I'll stop talking in a minute <laughs> is that um, in order to be a PD specialist, you need to, need to have experience working with children birth to five years of age in the setting for which you would want to be endorsed. Um, there are we endorse PD specialists based on our credential type. So if you've worked primarily in family child care or in the home setting, you would be endorsed to do visits for candidates who are applying in that setting. Um, additionally, just one year experience facilitating the professional growth of another adult, which most everyone here on this call would have. It's if you've ever acted as a lead teacher, a director, any type of a mentorship role um, would, would count for, for that experience requirement. Next is education. So we do require PDSs to have a bachelor's or an associate's degree in early childhood, elementary ed, home ec, or related field. 
Um, if you do have that related field, BA or AA, the degree just has to include a minimum of 18 semester or 24 quarter hours of coursework focused on early childhood education. And then last, you just need to have an active email address access to the internet because that is what uh, we use to both schedule and upload scores. And then a familiarity with local and national standards and requirements of child care programs because you will be in the program um, assessing the candidates. So kind of need to have that awareness of um, what's what's right and what's wrong, depending on where they are located. So this is what I mentioned in terms of types of PDS endorsements. So if you are someone who potentially works mostly in a, a home setting and you want to do family child care, but you previously have worked in a center based program working with infant toddlers, you can have multiple endorsements as a PDS. Um, we have many PDSs who have all of these endorsements, so conduct visits across um, all of our credential types, but you can also focus on one if that's um, where more of your experience has been. And then we also have multiple payment designations. So as I mentioned, we do have the we give every PDS $100 for every visit that they conduct. Um, and that is called an honorarium. That's our most common type of professional development specialist where the payment is given directly to the PDS. We also have a volunteer designation if someone's wanting to just donate their time to the field. Um, essentially, no payment would be remitted for that visit. And then last but not least, we have something called an agency designation. Um, this I will, if you're interested in something like this, I'll put my email in and we can talk more, but this is where your agency that you work for would get the visit, or sorry, would get the $100 honorarium for the visit as opposed to you directly. Um, this is used in a lot of cases where people are doing visits on work time. Um, so their organization is getting the um, honorarium payment as opposed to them individually. So I'm going to close out here with how to apply. Um, we have detailed eligibility requirements on our website. We have videos in terms of how to actually apply. Um, and we recommend getting your transcripts and work history together so you can just go through and easily input that into the application. Um, you apply directly from our website. And if approved, there is an online training that you're required to take and pass. It takes about four to six hours, depending on how long um, you, you may take it as self-paced. And then essentially you are endorsed as a um, PDS. So I will, um, once I stop sharing my screen, I'll put the link to our website as well as the link to our one pager that includes all this information more succinctly than I, I just went through it and is in both English and Spanish. Um, and so we will we'll put all those in the chat for you as well as our emails if you have any additional questions. And thank you, Vicki. It looks like she already put in the um, information. And in terms of formal or non-formal CDA, this would be for both. Um, the formal versus non-formal is actually just the designation that Indiana puts in place for training. Um, but in, for both of those, if you're going to get your credential, a candidate does need to have a visit by a PD specialist. So that's a good uh, example or a good question, sorry. Yay, that's a lot of information. So I'm glad we're recording this. I know, I'm sorry. And I talk super fast. So <laughs> no, that's OK. That's OK. Um, so you've put you'll put your emails in the chat for anybody that's interested in reaching out to you. You know, I've reached out to you already. Yes. Um, but that's another story. Um, so thank you guys, Vicki. Um, you're also the one that if anybody specifically in Indiana wants to reach out to you, you're the go-to gal, correct? Okay. <laughs> Let's chat. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks guys. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. All Have right. a good rest of your day. You too. All right, let's move on to Sam. Sam, will you introduce yourself and what your job is and educate us, please? Terrific, yeah, thanks, thanks, Noelle. Um, I am Sam Snydman. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations for United Way of Central Indiana. Uh, and you're probably wondering why is a guy from Central Indiana United Way coming to talk to this group? Um, the other thing that I do in my work uh, is uh, co-convene something with the with Early Learning Indiana called the Early Education Works Coalition. And so we're a 
statewide nonpartisan uh, advocacy group that um, you know that tries to promote good public policy in the early care and learning space. So essentially, the birth to eight uh, spectrum. And um, you know, uh, Noel happened to see me give a presentation to uh, the center directors on uh, what's happening here at the General Assembly with respect to child care and asked if I would be willing to do the same uh, for you all. And I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, but I'd like to start off uh, because this is a new group for me with the same expression I try to give to everyone. Uh, uh, everyone I, I talk to who works in this space uh, my wife was an early educator when we were first married, uh, the first three years of our marriage. She was uh, she was a teacher in a center. Um, so I, I have seen, uh, you know, very up close and personal the uh, the challenges, uh, the emotional and physical demands um, of the work that you all do every day. And, and, and I would assume doubly so since for some of you, th this work takes place in your home, uh, you know, maybe side by side with members of your own family. Uh, and so I just I want to express my deep, uh, deepest appreciation and gratitude for all the work that you do, not only to, to provide a safe and educative environment for kids that uh, you work with, but also for what the care that you provide enables uh, in the adults lives um, in those families and those households, right? Um, we, we know how important care is to the functioning of the rest of the economy and the rest of our lives. And so it's just really important uh, for me to acknowledge uh, and, and express my deepest appreciation for the work uh, that you and your colleagues across the sector do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now uh, because I have a PowerPoint uh, presentation and Noel, I will send this to you um, afterward and you're welcome to disseminate this uh, to the to the group. That's totally fine with me. Um, it's got my email address right on the front slide. So if you have questions um, after I'm finished, while I'm talking, whatever, uh, you know, please feel free to interrupt me. But if uh, later on you've got questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I keep my inbox perpetually open, uh, much to my wife's uh, real frustration. Um, I'm perhaps too attached to my cell phone. So um, our General Assembly started meeting uh last month, January 8th, which was uh, about a week later than they normally do. Um, this year, uh, 2024, is what we call a short session. Um, it is a non-budget year, so the General Assembly um, will not be appropriating any new money. Our state runs on what we call a biennial budget, so we, have, we, we set a budget for a two-year period. Uh, and we are right smack in the middle of of that. Uh, so this is a short session, which means we are only in session until about mid-March, uh, which is kind of crazy considering all the work that we try to get done. There were something like 750 uh, pieces of legislation that were offered by uh, representatives and House members um, this year, but only about 250, I think, um, made it across uh, the halfway point to the other chamber. So um, we are in this moment now where we've seen a lot of, of, of good ideas and, and some really bad ideas die, and we've seen some good ideas and some bad ideas keep moving. Um, and there we're going to come up in a couple of weeks on another time when some more bills will die and we'll sort of be left with a few things at the end of session to try to tie everything together while the general assembly is required by law to finish its work by march 14th um, during a short session we have been told 
uh, to expect that the General Assembly will probably finish its work uh, on March 8th or thereabouts. So maybe uh, as much as a week early, um, which again, when you take into consideration that this is normally a short session and we've shaved a week off the front and now possibly a week off the back, it doesn't leave a lot of time um, for the sort of debate and thoughtful consideration that you might expect your government to have. Uh, or maybe you don't expect your government to have that. Uh, I, I can see it both ways, to be perfectly honest. Um, I also want to provide uh, a picture of sort of what this this legislative process really looks like, right? So I think for some of us, those of us of a certain age, we remember the schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law song, right? Um, it is a it is a reference I feel comfortable I can use in this context um, as opposed to when I've taught classes for college students in the past, and increasingly I'm too old for um, for their pop culture references, and they are much too young for mine. And so uh, while the how a bill becomes a law, schoolhouse rock captures the sort of general thrust of of what you see in this chart. I also just want to sort of highlight that at our state level, um, there are a lot of places at which, you know, bills can can fall apart uh, and can die on their way to uh, becoming law. And I think that uh, this highlights a couple of things, right? One is the power of key decision makers in the legislature uh, from the President pro tem of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, uh, to committee chairs, um, to other sort of key vote, you know, sort of voting blocks within uh, the legislature. Um, you can have really good ideas that experts agree and data support, um, and things can be thwarted by the actions of just a couple of people uh, and, and keep you from getting where you want to be. Now, I think that this has largely been the case historically when we talk about child care and um, and other sorts of early care and learning issues, right? Uh, it, we as a state have not always historically um, made made the care professions, the care industry, uh, a priority. Uh, but I think we're starting to turn a corner because of things that we have seen, the realities you all have dealt with, uh, and that the families of the kids you care for have dealt with um, since the onset of the pandemic in 2020. So um, since we're at this sort of mid-session point, I wanna to try to provide some updates on some of uh, the childcare bills that have been moving, um, and and sort of walk you through what what those pieces of legislation would do if they become law. And before I get to get to those, I also just want to just want to mention there were probably eight to ten bills I think in total filed uh, on child care issues this session. Many of which did not receive committee hearings. Many uh, of which. Um, you know, they, they were introduced and that was sort of the end of their journey. Uh, and uh, some of which had, had great ideas. They were really, you know, there, there was real merit to wanting to have those conversations. Um, but many of them had what, what we refer to in this building as fiscal impact, which often means they cost money. That's sort of layman's term for fiscal impact. It, it costs money, right? And uh, this being a non-budget year, uh, th those were sort of not picked up, um, but they do serve as important ways to socialize around the sort of budgetary and fiscal investments we can continue to make in the child care sector. And so I'll talk a little bit as well about how we want to do that heading into next year when we have a budget. Uh, process. So um, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, this session is Senate Bill 2, 
which um, is it was identified by the Senate as a priority piece of legislation. It was identified by Governor Holcomb's office as a priority piece of legislation. Um, and this is really a first for for child care in some time, um, in at least a, at least a decade, um, where we we uh, where our legislative bodies and our governor's office have said that the child care has sort of risen to this sort of this uh, point where we need to make it front and center, right? Low bill numbers in uh, a legislature generally indicate that this is something that leadership supports. And so uh, Senate Bill 2 uh, being a child care bill is a huge, huge win for elevating the importance of the child care industry um, in Indiana and, and the problems that are facing it to, to this sort of uh, level. Um, Senate Bill 2 was the result also of some work that was done by the legislature over the summer. Uh, we had a summer study committee uh, of legislators and others um, who heard testimony from providers and from chambers of commerce and other kinds of employers, nonprofit organizations like United Way, um, all the different stakeholders, parents, right? All the different stakeholders who are served by the child care system. Um, and I think what they heard were a few things, right? One, that, you know, every everybody who's out here providing care is super well-intentioned, but they are under-resourced. That, um, and, and that those lack of resources, whether they are financial, whether they are from a professional development standpoint, whether they are from um, a regulatory uh, lack of support for the work that you do, um, that that all of, for credentials, right? Like all of these things make it harder for you all to provide care, makes it harder for you all um, to attract and retain good uh, qualified child care workers to serve kids and families. Um, and that it is these these issues are particularly felt in uh, child care deserts, which unfortunately too much of our state, uh, you know, sort of is a child care desert. Uh, and so what we what we tried to do in Senate Bill 2 was create, uh, create a piece of legislation that can be something like a down payment on continued investment and policy change to support the child care system. And so a few of the things that, that are in this bill that I think are really, really important. One, um, continuing the process that the Early Learning Advisory Committee and FSSA are engaged in to, um, to create a more streamlined uh, and, and sensible system for past equality, for licensing, um, and and just for the regulatory environment in general, right? So that it's easier for you all to do your jobs well um, and provide the care that families need. Also, to to find ways to support the shortfall or address the shortfall of qualified child care workers. And so, a few things that the bill does in this space: um, one, it uh, makes child care workers categorically eligible for child care development and uh, child care development fund and uh, on my way pre-k supports right so unfortunately as probably many of you know uh, many of, of your colleagues are alre already qualified because of low wages for these kinds of supports what we're doing is creating um, a way to capture uh, folks who are just a little above, um, you know, those uh, that 150 percent of federal poverty line, uh, really all the way up to the federal uh, ceiling of 85 percent of state median income. So we should be able to capture most child care workers uh, in the state uh, who have kids who need uh, care supports. And, and while uh, we aren't able to do things like a direct wage subsidy in a non-budget year. What this functionally does is is works as like 
it's sort of a substitute wage subsidy. It's a way you know, sort of expense replacement for lack of a better term, right? So um, again, a, a way to provide a down payment on additional supports when we can in a budget year. Um, related to this also is a, a commission to study uh, compensation for child care workers and how we can ensure as a state that we have the right financial supports in place in the next budget to make sure that providers and child care workers um, can can adequately staff and maintain um, you know the, those workforce pools. So really exciting stuff. Um, you know, certainly probably later than then we should have addressed some of these issues, but um, but very exciting uh, nevertheless. Uh, I also, uh, so on this third bullet point, addressing barriers to access, part of this is gonna come through uh, the creation of something called a micro center pilot, uh, creating some, some sites to more flexibly staff and support on and near site care, um, you know, that's sort of, I guess, more oriented toward uh, employers. This may also involve um, partnerships with home-based providers, um, you know, to, to use commercial spaces that, um, you know, that can be used to, to, to provide some of this care, right? So um, that's a, that, that pilot will be administered by FSSA. Um, there will be input on how that pilot looks probably from this group uh, as well as the center-based uh, group. Um, so uh, more details to come from FSSA on what exactly that looks like. Uh, additionally, um, this there's some language in this bill that'll make it easier for uh, public schools and well, schools of all types to become on my way pre-K providers, which is, um, something that uh, I think there is a lot of interest in from our policymaker friends here and from school corporations uh, and charter schools around the state. Finally, we want to increase the sort of like data transparency uh, that's out here in the space. Uh, FSSA has a ton of data and uh, it's really hard to get a hold of sometimes and it's really hard to use and and as a result it's really difficult for advocates and community partners and uh, even providers to know how well are we using our uh, how well are we using the investments that we're making as a state um, if I'm a family you know is is the care finder website the sort of like best most, user-friendly uh, site that I have to go to, to to find the things that I'm interested in. So there are some requirements around uh, data reporting from different agencies um, and, and some requirements for some additional dashboards and data transparency from FSSA in this bill. Um, this has been a really great, I think, story of bipartisan um, stakeholder engaged uh, you know, sort of legislative policy making. You know, we, we heard four hours worth of testimony over the summer. Uh, we heard another couple of hours when this bill was heard uh, on the Senate side in committee. It's attracted, uh, you know, it, it, it passed the Senate. It says the House that was, I, I knew that typo was there. It passed the Senate 48 to 1. Uh, and uh, just huge bipartisan support, bipartisan authors and co-authors on that bill. Um, it's being heard this week in the House, and we expect a similar kind of bipartisan reception uh, there as well. A couple of other early care and learning bills I want to just highlight for folks. Uh, Senate Bill 147 is a child care property tax exemption uh, bill. And uh, it's essentially create expanding opportunities for, uh, you know, to, to take advantage of an, an existing property tax deduction uh, for providers uh, who are for-profit providers. 
um, and a partial property tax exemption for employers who are providing on-site care uh, for employees' families. So um, it is a it is a way to use the tax system, hopefully, in a way that incentivizes the creation or expansion of uh, child care operations, both from uh, you know sort of the independent provider side and from the business community. Uh, this one has been a little bit more uh, controversial because it's you know a tax related issue, and so. Uh, people feel very uh, conflicted about, um, you know, sort of using the tax system, the property tax system in particular in this way. Um, one of the things that we've tried to mention to folks is uh, the importance of ensuring that we keep in mind other types of property tax payers, right, homeowners, um, you know, probably being the, the primary example that uh, as you sh sort of shift these, these uh, costs around, someone's ultimately gonna have to pay it. So we wanna make sure that while we are incentivizing the right kinds of activities like providing care, that we're doing so in a, in a financially responsible way. Uh, House Bill 1102 is probably the bill that will be most relevant to this group because it mostly focuses on um, home-based, licensure types. And so when this bill was originally drafted, it was essentially a deregulation bill and it would have uh, allowed class one home uh, licensees to essentially continue to claim to be class one licensees, but not be subject to regulation. They would just have to register um, with the Family and Social Services Agency. And in fact, even if you weren't previously a licensee and just wanted to have a, a class one home, uh, you could open a class one home and call yourself a class one home and never have been subject to any of the regulation. Um, obviously, this was a, a very concerning thing for a lot of reasons. Um, we worked very closely with the, the bill author and, and, and author, the bill authors in the House um, to amend that that language out um, because it was really uh, you know concerning not only to us uh, as an organization that um, you know does a lot of professional development supports uh, for home and center based uh, child care providers, but also as um, an organization that cares about sort of whole family development and um, concerns about, you know, sort of safety, quite frankly, for kids in, in some of those situations. Um, now what the bill does, and, and Noel, I'll send you a copy of the bill. You can distribute this to the group as well. Um, it makes a lot more modest adjustments to, um, to home-based licensure types, including um, increasing the number of kids that can be uh, sort of watched at any one time in a in certain class in certain homes of you know depending on the licensure type uh, it extends the length of uh, home licensure types from two years to three years as long as those licenses haven't been subject to suspension or revocation uh, previously it also pro prohibits local zoning ordinances from, from prohibiting child care homes. And this was something that um, we heard about during the summer study committee. Uh, a number of um, organizations, uh, employers primarily, who wanted to open child care homes uh, to serve the, the child care needs of their employees um, and who were prohibited from doing so by really restrictive local zoning ordinances. Um, and so while locals will still have the ability to have zoning ordinances that prohibit the placement of childcare homes in like industrial parks or things like that, uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, prohibit the opening of childcare homes simply because they are childcare homes there has to be sort of another policy or safety rationale um, to accompany that. And so 
Um, this bill, again, was uh, a, a bipartisan uh, effort in the House um, and is uh, on the calendar for second reading, uh, so amendments um, from the floor in the Senate today. I suspect that it will probably be held um, again because the I haven't seen amendments that are supposed to be uh, posted uh, yet, and so I'm, I'm thinking there's probably some ongoing conversation around ways to further amend this to to really get at um, things that are supportive of home-based child care uh, and sort of also at the same time reiterating the importance of health and safety uh, of kids and, and families. Um, the last bill I'll talk about uh, is Senate Bill 1, which is a sort of reading skills bill. It's what most people think of as the reading retention bill. If, if kids can't read by third grade, they can't pass the I read, then, then there's the retention piece. Um, I, I mention this primarily because I know many of you work in environments where you're trying to lay those foundational skills um, for for reading and literacy. Um, you're working really hard on, on those things with kids. Um, I, I think that there, there is increased attention to um, how important those early years are for brain development and the, and the sort of development of the habits and skills uh, that are necessary to, to create literate and uh, literate citizens, but also kids who like to read, not just that can read, but enjoy doing it. And so, um, you know, I just want to highlight this to continue to, to express just how important the work that you all do is um, to making sure that, that kids have all the things that they need to be successful. And that's it in terms of my PowerPoint. Um, I will back out of the screen share here. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions now. I'm happy to um, I'm happy to take questions offline. Uh, but Noel, I will share the these bills and um, the the PowerPoint with you, and you're you're welcome to distribute those as you need. Okay, great. And I think. We also have a um, home providers and support page that I will try to um, send you the link to if you're on Facebook, because mm -hmm. a lot of our providers will be um, going there um, for information and support. And it's where we're trying to direct everybody to besides this link. So um, that's a lot of information to digest. But I thought it was good for our home providers to have at least one resource person. If nothing else, if they reach out to you, they can be directed to, you need to send a letter here or yep. who do I contact? Because we get a lot of mixed information on social media and that seems to be um, kind of where people get their information. So I wanna make sure they're directed in how we can be proactive in our, our business. So. All your information was awesome, and I will apologize now if you get bombarded here in the future by some home providers that will later on see this video. Um, we are getting close. We've got like five minutes. Um, I don't know. So thank you, Sam. I'm going to move on real quick. I don't know if we have any specific information that any of our committees wanted to quickly share that are on um on the the meeting do we have anybody okay i do know that um where'd she go in the chat we had uh lindsay who was from um teach that it that she put her email in there if anybody had any questions for teach but she couldn't stay on also i don't know Nancy, do you know, I know Pam had said something about all of our committee members are going to have to do or renew renew their ethics training. Do you know where we'll be able to access that, access that or would that I, be something to reach out to Pam? You probably should reach out to Pam on that. 
Okay. Um, and since you're recording this, how will we be able to get the link to this recording? You should be able to go. I don't know. Elizabeth, are you still on here or Kareem? Do you know? Technology is not my strong she, suit. I believe she posts along with the minutes. I believe this will be posted after on the website for you to be able to go back and review. Okay, because I was just wondering, since we won't get to the meeting minutes till the next meeting, can this at least be, can we at least have the link for this to be able to look at? I would say go ahead and reach out to Pam. Yes. <laughs> but so she'll have access to the link is my. Yes. We won't yes. lose it once we disconnect. This is my thing no, because right. I'm not technology savvy oh. either. Correct. And I did put a, a couple of um, links in the chat early on. The last link was uh, for center, so you can disregard that. I did add the one for the Homes Advisory Group at the bottom of the chat. But I dropped a uh, link in there. It's at a 107 p.m. is when I did it. The first link is for the link to early care and education transformation about growing system capacity and increasing high quality programs. The second one is about our new um, position. We have emerging provider specialists and they are to help these the new providers get ready for that initial inspection. And we have two in the state and there is a map on this link. Um, if you know someone who's brand new, they might reach out to the specialist. The third one is about statistics and reports, um, the CCDF overview, child care licensing, um, the monthly date and year to date data and a PTQ overview. And then the one I dropped in later just recently is uh, the advisory groups page. So if anybody needs access to that. And we do have um, three new consultants we just hired. Yesterday was their first day. Um, okay. And we do have a new homes consultant. Those of you who had Melissa Turner, we have a new consultant that started yesterday. But until then, you'll still reach out to Kareem, which is her regional manager. We have a new legally licensed exempt consultant in the northwest part of the state. And I have a new facilities consultant in the southeast part of the Part of the state so we have brand, three brand new consultants okay um so i uh, thank you for sharing that that mm -hmm. is a lot of information do you know when these get recorded because i've never gone back and looked at them are the chats able to be linked into can people go back and see these email links and and all of that stuff in the chats they should be able to because that's where i'm dropping them i know we can see them on our end so I'm, i would assume you could Okay, and while we're dropping links, for those of you that aren't necessarily or haven't ha heard from me reaching out to direct you to go to this, I put the link for the resource and referral for the home providers also on the Facebook for any of the resource and referral people and anybody that wants to be able to reach the home providers. Um, we're trying to get that resource up and going for everybody um, to direct them then to you guys besides the normal outlets that we have. Is there anybody else that is needing to share anything? Real quick. Okay. Awesome. Um, so our future meetings, our next one will be May 2nd. We'll try to reach out to everybody and make sure when we send, I'd like to have when we send out the calendar or the invites be able to figure out how we can link the agenda into that for everybody to have a copy of. Um, and for our, I think Joey, we had, I believe two more um, committee members join in later and I wanna make sure they get on the attendance. Let's see, I know it, one was Jennifer, are you still on? Okay, uh, Joey, I have the names to give you. Um, and okay. committee, committee members, uh, thank you for coming through and making sure we could have a meeting. I think this was really successful. To initially start out with 31 people Absolutely. on here was great and showed great representation. We're not done yet. We're just getting mm -hmm. started. I think 
we have been working hard to get everybody connected and make sure we we still have a couple people in some regions we need to make sure we can get representation from and with that if no one else is going to say anything um we need to have somebody uh, move to approve adjournment and then someone second that um can i just say right quick this is sabrina chase i was one of them that came in probably about 10 minutes late okay thank you sabrina yes hi this is Kamala Steffi. i'd like to make the motion to adjourn the session this is Sabrina Chase, I'll second. Thank you guys. We will all, we'll be in touch before the next meeting, but thank you to everybody for zooming in and have a good rest of your week. Thank you for recording, Nancy. You're welcome. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye.